This is Fifth, and you're watching the XJW Fifth YouTube channel. I'm very happy today to be joined by Alicia Joseph. Uh, she is a former Jehovah's Witness and a former pioneer. So, Alicia, first of all, I would like to really extend a warm welcome uh, to you, and uh, thank you for taking time out to speak with me today. Yeah, I'm grateful to be sharing my story and, and help anyone that I can. Absolutely, and I'm grateful to have you on. So, can you tell us a little bit about um, the beginning of your story? How is it that you uh, came to be involved with Jehovah's Witnesses? Um, well, on my mother's side, I'm actually fourth generation and uh, come from a very, very long line of very faithful, um, committed Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, and on both sides of the family, uh, my grandfather was a pioneer. He was a Bethelite, um, very well known in the Georgetown Canadian branch, Bethel. Um, you know, he used to fly and take literature to the to different um, areas where the need is great and, and just very well known. So our family name um, was, uh, you know, quite a large extended community within Jehovah's Witnesses. I see. Was that something that uh, caused you to feel any pressure as you were growing up to kind of live up to the family name? Um, you know, absolutely. In some ways it was, um, you know, it, there was a lot of pressure surrounding it because, um, my grandfather was pretty intense. He was Greek. And so he always shared these really extravagant stories that we all kind of, um, thought he was crazy at the time, but, um, yeah, just very committed in sharing the truth. Mm -hmm. And it, it really did spark an incentive in me to, to want to try to inspire people and help people, especially because you actually are raised to believe that you're not just sharing good news, you're saving lives. Um, and, and so, you know, I think in some ways it was kind of cool because you know, it was almost like being popular within the organization. I'd go to assemblies and people would recognize my family. And, you know, sometimes you're even treated a little bit, you know, different um, because of that. So you know, both sides. I see. So when you would go out, you would get recognized. Uh, your family name carried a lot of weight. Uh, but what about at home? How would you describe your home life growing up as one of Jehovah's Witnesses? Um, well, if you're a Jehovah's Witness, um, most people know that there's there's two sides to every life, like anything. Um, but in our family, there was a great deal of pretending. Um, you know, in religious organizations like Jehovah's Witnesses, there are so many different expectations of you to look a, sit a certain way, sit a certain way, speak a certain way. Um, and, you know, at the Kingdom Hall, we would be all those approved, you know, you know, in that approval behavioral state. Um, but at home, I mean, I grew up in a really small town in Canada. And um, a lot of the families were cleaners, in, including mine, um, because as you know, they're encouraged to to do jobs that uh, almost are as, as living as martyrs to be blessed more. Um, and so, you know, you sacrifice things and and uh, don't focus on materialism. But, um, you know, a lot of those families were in, in basically a state of survival. Um, also, my father was an alcoholic growing up, as well as his father. Um, and so it was a very abusive environment, um, and, and verbally abusive, uh, really bad, but pretty much all the men that I was surrounded by on my mother's side, my father's side, uh, men in the kingdom hall, uh, even close friends of families, all, you know, I was surrounded all by very, very abusive men. Um, you know, and that took its toll, especially because, um, you know, if you actually read the Bible, <laughs> it talks about the, you know, the warm spirit that we're supposed to carry and the fruitages of the spirit and whatnot. It is extremely conflicting um, and pressing on the conscience when you're being treated one way at home and then at the kingdom hall, you're pretending to be another way. Um, and, you know, I had extreme circumstances where you know, from a very young age, I was, you know, seven, eight years old, and we clean banks and business offices. And so my father would take my older brother, who was three and a half years older, and I into work, you know, at an early time, sometimes four o'clock in the afternoon, right after school, and sometimes till one in the morning, mm. breaking for meetings in between. Um, and, you know, that was exhausting, especially because with, you know, with the drinking, um, he would drop us off at these places and sometimes we wouldn't know when he would come back. 
Um, and the thing that really stood out in my mind is that this was a known behavior um, with Jehovah's Witnesses. It wasn't just like my family was having this um, experience. It was many of the families there. And they all knew, and a lot of them were all ministerial servants and elders, and they covered for each other, even though you know they were on platforms speaking and then treating their families um, differently at home. Um, and as you know, women, um, they're, they're so suppressed uh, that, you know, there would be times where I would go to the elders and my mom would go to the elders and it would be like, you know, the insinuation of what are you doing to stir this on and you're not praying enough, you're not being faithful enough. And that's what's bringing the stress on your family as a whole instead of any any people in the organization actually taking responsibility and accountability for their own actions. I'm sure many of us can relate to that. Uh you know, it really just highlights the misogyny that's involved in the organization, as well as, you know, the desire to put on the perfect face when you're in front of uh, people in the congregation. Now, did those factors kind of shape your opinion of the organization, um, you know, just make you feel a certain way uh, as you were uh, observing these things? Yes, definitely. I mean, when you're being taught on a daily basis, like I was saying, that you can save people's lives and that it's so important for you to be in that paradise where you get to actually then live how you really want to live. Um, everything is about putting your present life on hold. There's nothing about living presently. Um, and because, you know, being such a young age, you know, I was very sensitive and very intuitive, like a full on empath since I was a young child. Um, you know, because I suppress all these feelings, I was, uh, you know, had continual health problems. Um, I speak about this on different platforms and how your emotional reaction to your surroundings creates um, dis-ease in the body, which creates disease. Um, so I, I have notes here. I mean, by the time I was 11, my appendix had ruptured. Mm. Um, I was in oxygen tents for days at a time with asthma. I had severe allergies. I had TMJ, stomach ulcers, stomach hernia. Um, I mean, so on. I'm dealing with stress in ways that, because in that organization, you can't come to talk to anyone. You can't be suggested to read books. So I even got to the point where I don't really remember all of it, but I would even begin to pull out my hair mm. um, in absolute frustration because as much as I was so devoted to God and doing the right thing, it conflicted because a lot of the things, even as a child, I identified uh, weren't weren't right. They weren't actually scriptural and biblical. Um, and um, as you know, uh, therapy or, you know, any kind of speaking to psychiatrists and books, all of that is frowned upon. Um, Jehovah's Witnesses are live in such fear of the, the worldly environment and that influence because they actually don't want you to become educated to the truth. So it wasn't like, I mean, I was in libraries because I was such a book nerd and just like soaking up books, but I would never turn to those self-help books or, you know, enlightenment or any kind of like things to deal with stress because I thought that that would create a worldly influence. Um, and even the elders had said to me when I talked to them about my family that if you go to a therapist or if your father goes to AA meetings or goes to get help, they'll put worldly thoughts in their head and then you're leaving yourself open to the attack of Satan, which is going to cause more family problems. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you feel like you're pretty much in a, in a lose lose situation. Um, I know along those same lines, uh, one thing that I had been looking at recently uh, as far as something that had been printed in the past was to be careful about group therapy sessions, because, you know, you might end up saying something that either, tells on somebody else that's supposed to be kept in house, you know, within the family or within the organization, or, you know, you may just give a bad impression of what it is to be a Jehovah's witness. So there's all of these types of things that I'm sure played a role into your just continuing to sink further and further into that, uh, that extreme stress, uh, and that depression that you were experiencing. Um, Absolutely. 
Absolutely. And, and to just add to that, um, I was <clears> just going to mention, again, me coming from such a small town. I mean, the public school I grew up in was about 90 people from kindergarten to grade eight. Mm. So you can imagine um, the emphasis and how many local needs parts they would give about seeking outside help. Again, because of those group things or even in a session privately when you go to speak in a small town, people talk. And, you know, that would be exposed and they wanted to keep it very much on the down low that this is a very segregated, happy people, you know, uh, just knocking on doors, bringing you good news. Right. Right. I can definitely understand that. So uh, did that situation just persist? Did you remain that way throughout, uh, you know, many more years or or what happened next for you? Um, well, uh, you know. Because of behaving in that in that conflicted state, obviously, um, I was I would appear always really, really happy. I was like the sunshine for people. Um, but at home, people knew. I mean, I was my family knew I was crying. I was obviously saddened and and hurt. Um, and you know that when people are in that state, um, how energy works is is you you manifest and you call to yourself how how you feel about yourself and because you know my self worth was so low and I had so many aspirations to be a singer and a dancer and a you know really involved in the arts of poetry and writing books and all that and that would be frowned upon obviously for especially a woman to be out there and and exposing themselves so to say. Um, and so because I was so conflicted, um, I was also exposed to a lot of abuse um, and sexual abuse, not as severe as some of my friends um, because of, of their low self-worth. Again, they're you know put in a position where they think that the things that would happen would be the normal and you don't come forward and you don't speak. Um, there were times where I was doing door-to-door -door work. And um, because I was so, you know, quiet and meek and, um, you know, just just quiet and meek as I was supposed to be as a sister, uh, men took advantage. I remember, you know, being really young at a book study and going to walk past a man and him pulling me onto his lap. Um, and then I remember in service when I was pioneering, uh, there was another sister and I, and we would go to get into the car. And as we would go to sit down, you know, uh, these brothers, ministerial servants, putting their hands out to, to grope, so to say. Um, and, you know, after a while, when, when things like that happen from a young age and they persist, you again, believe that that's a normalcy because as much as Jehovah's Witnesses, um, they like to preach and, you know, give statements about how they don't approve of any kind of sexual abuse. Um, everyone that, that I knew, you know, when you come forward, they, there's just like this systemized structure of things that they tell you, which is number one, why did you put yourself in that situation? They, they blame the victim as if, um, They've called it upon themselves, which is impossible for, you know, a six-year-old child. Um, and then two, they tell you that you need to pray more and you need to wait on Jehovah and that vengeance is his. And they also told me, if I don't wait on Jehovah, that means that I don't have faith in him and his wonderful works. And if I don't have faith, then it leads to my prayers being hindered. And if your prayers are hindered, then you're left in darkness and you're left open to Satan's attack for more bad things. So you can see this became, um, you know, this massive cycle of just low self-esteem, low self-worth. And um, because that is that is their policies and procedures within that organization. Absolutely. It's like they have fail safes, so to speak, you know, at every turn uh, so that you never feel like you're worthy of saying anything. And you j it just leads to you continuing to, to push those things down. So I'm very sorry that you um, that you had to endure that. Now, um, that's something that you experienced mainly, you're saying, as a, as a child, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, there, there were different instances that went on into, into teen years. Like mm. I said, not, uh, not as severe as, as some of the people in that small town. <laughs> it was exceptionally uh, bizarre. Uh, there were groups of children who were sexually abused together uh, by, 
by couples. Um, and those are actually being in investigated right now. Wow. I can't even imagine what a terrible ordeal uh, that would have been for all of those children. But it is good that, you know, these things are being brought to light now. Um, how would you say that you dealt with all of these situations? Were there any was there anything that you did to to try to endure what you were going through? Um, absolutely. I mean, um, in the inside, I mean, I, I hated my life. Home was it was rough and mm. and I disliked myself. Um, I was very unpopular at school, to say the least. Um, and and of course, being a Jehovah's Witness added to that, being a you know the nerd, um, especially because um, you know I felt very alone at home, mm -hmm. very alone at the Kingdom Hall. And even though at the Kingdom Hall I was surrounded by so many young people, no one could really know the real me. I couldn't really talk about anything that I wanted to do. Um, because as you know, you're not even allowed to use the words dream or gifts <clears throat> because that would be taking away from the glory of God. So none of that is, is, is allowed, so to say. And then I went to school and I really just focused on my schoolwork and, you know, wanting to get the highest grades. I was on the chess team and the history whiz team and the fastmatics team and just kind of, you know, embrace myself in the love of a couple really great teachers that I had. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, and then just immerse myself also fully in the Bible teachings, because as much as these imperfect people, as Jehovah's Witnesses like to say, so they don't take accountability for actions, um, you know, I never wanted to blame their behavior on what Jehovah had in store for me. So, um, you know, I was a little bit of an oddball at school because, you know, when I didn't like a student or, you know, someone was mean to me. Um, or even I had this one principal who, who really disliked Jehovah's Witnesses. And I used to tell them all that, um, that I don't care what they think because they're going to die at Armageddon. And if and Armageddon might come tomorrow. And, and that'll be the death of them and that it. And for some reason, I actually believed that I had that authority to just say so, because that is what Jehovah's Witnesses teach. It doesn't matter, you know, their circumstances, their upbringing or anything. If you are not attending at that facility um, and haven't committed to the Watchtower Bible and Track Society, um, you will lose your life when God says so. Um, and so um, I really just immersed myself in, um, in the Bible, because it was kind of like my safe haven. And because there was so much, you know, stress at home. And as you know, at school, you can't fit in, you don't celebrate holidays. Um, you know, and again, being in that small, small town, kids were talking about what they were doing on the weekends and all the fun they were having. And I was just cleaning and knocking on doors. Um, and so, um, you know, I just, I would read the Bible all the time. I loved poetry. And so the Bible, you know, it connected with me. Um, and uh, I wanted to be the best Jehovah's Witness there was because I wanted to make sure that if Armageddon came while I was sleeping that night, I was going to wake up the next day in a paradise. Mm. Um, you know, I was pretty zealous. By the time I was 11, um, I wanted to get baptized, but I didn't actually end up getting baptized until um, I was 13. Uh, it was July 4th, 1993. Uh, but before that, I was getting sometimes 70 hours a month of volunteer service knocking on doors mm. uh, because I thought, you know, the more doors I knock on and, you know, preach the word, I will be blessed more and maybe it'll help at home and, you know, maybe it'll help with my life and, you know, just getting that kind of security. Um, and so uh, July 4th, 93, I got baptized with my older brother and a couple other friends, um, my older brother pretty much really did get baptized because his little sister was getting baptized too. <laughs> I see. Um, and you know that, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, I'm growing up in a small town, the younger, the better, you know, it looks better for the family, better for the organization. And, and you, you wouldn't want to have a younger sibling committing their life to Jehovah when you haven't yet, because again, that, that affects the way you're treated it affects um, the way you're perceived by people, um, and it also affects your own self-esteem because in the back of your mind, you believe that if you haven't dunked under that water and given your oath to uh, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, 
that you are left open for attack on your life. Right. You know, that's so interesting what you're saying uh, about the pressure that your older brother uh, would have felt. Uh, Jehovah's Witness literature likes to say that when someone gets baptized, it's this very solemn thing and they're really making this personal relationship with Jehovah and they understand all of the implications. But we've seen it, you know, those of us, especially those of us who have been raised in the organization, we've seen that there is a lot of pressure. And when you start getting to a certain age, people start kind of looking at you sideways, like, okay, you're 15 or whatever. And especially, you know, I can imagine if you had a young, younger sibling or an older sibling, rather, that hasn't yet taken that step. I know in, in my family, uh, my all of us had gotten baptized between nine and 13. And there were four that got baptized between those years. And my brother, I think, had gotten to 15, my younger brother. Uh, and even him being the youngest, the fact that he went to an age that was beyond where we got before we got baptized, he was receiving a lot of pressure, you know, to get baptized as well. So as, as you say, um, it's definitely the younger, the better. And especially if you have people surrounding you that are doing that, you know, that could kind of be the impetus uh, to, to move you towards doing that. Now, would you say that uh, the people that were around you, you know, your peers that were also Jehovah's Witnesses, would you say that they were uh, also of the same mind, if you will? Were they just as uh, zealous as far as uh, doing things according to the organization? Um, well, I was, I was a little extra zealous, <laughs> but there were many who, because it's such a fear-driven organization, um, we would sit together in groups and talk about how we'd have reoccurring nightmares about Armageddon, um, you know, things like that. Um, and a lot of the young people did get baptized early. And as you know, um, you're not allowed to date anyone, especially, right, or get married unless you're baptized and then get married in the Kingdom Hall. So it's it's a sequence of things where they they groom you very, very carefully to make sure that, you know, they're keeping their people in amongst a very fear-based mind control um, space. Um, now, the young people um, that I grew up with, um, again, being in that small town, there, you know, we had to drive like a good 45 minutes to get anywhere, basically, with a mall, say. Mm. <laughs> so um, there's a lot of idle time. So it's either, you know, kids were in service or they were doing really extreme things. Um, a lot of the young people I grew up with, and there was a good, you know, 40, 42 young people in the area between the, the couple congregations. Um And I mean, they went into really extreme circumstances from, you know, drugs, abortion, you know, sex, all of these things that, you know, young people generally do. Um, but we're talking about Jehovah's Witnesses, the mindset where, um, you know, there we're groomed, we were groomed to believe that um, it's such a big part of those people's lives. And so, you know, these young people were um, doing like just way, way more things that, that, that just normal kids who weren't Jehovah's Witnesses were doing because number one, they thought they were missing out on something. And number two, when you're raised uh, looking at these magazines where you, you're you seeing pictures over and over again on a weekly basis showing pictures of young people who aren't Jehovah's Witnesses, um, you know, anyone who's left the organization, they're like sitting under a bridge with, you know, a needle ready to put like, whatever in their arm and their prostitutes and, you know, selling their bodies everywhere. And when you are groomed to create that belief system, you act on what you believe, right? And so these kids just started to attract this stuff. And <clears throat> they were doing things like, um, you know, giving people drugs when they weren't aware. I was one of them. Um, I went, you know, uh, elders, kids, you know, the, the elders and their wives would have parties at at other people's houses and all the kids would have parties at, at other houses. Um, you know, the parents were off getting drunk and the kids were doing drugs and, um, and they would go in service door to door to scope out houses because we lived in a tourist area. Mm. Um, and then go back later that night, break into houses, steal things. I mean, it would be in the paper. They'd be making jokes. They'd be wearing jewelry to assemblies that they had stolen the night before wow. um, or, you know, a few days before, whichever. But we're talking, um, you know, extreme things because 
they thought, um, again, you know, they're programmed that this is what worldly people are exposed to and do, which is very unrealistic and is very sad. <laughs> wow. You know, I think a lot of times we don't really think about it like that, but, you know, just the, the image that is portrayed as to what you could end up being really does, especially with that child brain or that young, young mind kind of push you towards that. I can, I can definitely see how that could happen. Um, so were you involved in uh, a lot of the things that the uh, children were involved in or were you able to kind of keep a distance or how did that work out for you? Um, well, you know, I re remained a distance in certain areas, but um, most of the, you know, my close friends were anywhere between like two and six years older. So when I was like 13, 14, you know, they're close to 20 or they're over 20 or whatever. And so it was easy for me to be exposed to drinking. Um, I never got heavily involved in drugs or boys. <laughs> it was like the fear was like totally instilled in me in that area. But, um, you know, I was exposed to a lot of really crazy, inappropriate things. Um, and this one night we had this girl's party and, you know, it was probably about eight months after I was baptized. So it was like maybe 14, uh, was my first exposure to, uh, someone bringing a joint to a party and we all, uh, partook for what kids know how to partake at that point. Um, and I had such a conscious, I was so scared of, of death all the time that I actually came forward and I told my parents and they passed me the phone and they said, call the elders and tell them what you've done. Um, fast forward that led to me being publicly reproved, mm -hmm. which is, as you know, an announcement from the, the congregation platform, um, saying that, you know, this person has done something you know, disgustingly sinful in the eyes of God. And now we are taking away their privileges. So the privileges I had take, taken away was I couldn't pioneer, I couldn't comment, and I couldn't give talks. Um, but I wasn't the only one. In one night, there was like 17 young people, hmm. publicly approved or disfellowshipped. And then the week after, at the next congregation, there was a ton of kids disfellowshipped, publicly approved. Right. And it was just like, a really, really chaotic time where I think I've suppressed even a lot of the memories because the stress of that was so much because when a Jehovah's Witness um, child does something like put a cigarette to their mouth and, and smoke or they drink underage, um, you know, I was a young girl and I was, I was left sitting in the Kingdom Hall in a room at like 9 o'clock, 9.30 at night with three men asking me very detailed questions, not only about my experience, but because there were so many older kids involved um, in sex before marriage, um, I had three men asking me very detailed, disgusting, intimate sexual questions about my friend's experience and what I knew that they had done, mm. which now that I have three daughters and a son, I can't even imagine exposing my children and putting them in a room alone with men to ask them such vulgar questions. I mean, some of the questions, sexual questions I was asked at that age, I didn't even know what some of the things that they were talking about. Um, and so it's very, very stressful for a young person being a Jehovah's Witness. And it's like, you don't realize how stressful it is until you get older and have your own children. And I think you, you can reflect and look back, but obviously once you've left, you realize, this is unnatural. I mean, this is, you know, part of youth and growing up and um, just, you know, some of the small things that they did or that I did were made out to be so severe, <clears throat> so shameful. Mm -hmm. So when those privileges were taken away from me, um, after three months, you know, I requested that I could have them back. And um, I was turned down the first time. And during that time, I worked even harder, getting more hours in service to prove to them, you know, I'm, I'm, I love Jehovah. And when they turned me down the first time, they said, you know, you're going to be, you've already been on two assembly parts because I had been on two assembly parts. So it was already like, you know, like this exemplary witness. And they said to me, you know, think of how when you come back, you can be on, you know, other assembly parts and you can talk about how destructive Satan's world is and how you were led astray and come back again, mentally manipulating and grooming 
the example that, that they can make of me to, to pull people in. So it is a disturbing time. I, I can only imagine, uh, especially you, you already talked about the judicial uh, committee process and, you know, the things that you've described are just really disgusting uh, with, with three older gentlemen and a 14 year old girl. It's just it's almost unfathomable. It would be if we didn't know that this was something that happened all the time. Right. It was very normal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, as far as the announcement, just briefly, how did that feel being read off as publicly reproved? And we, we, of course, understand the implications of that. You already described this person has done something disgusting and has, I guess, showed enough repentance. So we're not going to kick her out. But she could have been kicked out for this. That's basically kind of what it means. Mm-hmm. What was that? What was going through your mind when you heard that announcement for everybody to hear? Um, well, oh my gosh. I mean, I just melted into my chair and I was crying, but I, you know, it gave me resilience, I guess, because I'm sitting there and I thought, you know, I'm going to go to this meeting and I'm going to be brave and courageous and prove that, you know, yes, I've, I've done something shameful by putting a cigarette to my mouth or whatever. Um, but I'm going to prove to them that I still love Jehovah. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm telling you there, I mean, just the, it's just your whole, like every little bit of self-esteem you have, everything you've built, um, there's so much shame associated with that um, and guilt, uh, the way people are looking at you because you know it's like people are looking at you now and parents are talking to, about you. And I was a little child, you know, um, and those conversations, uh, you know, with the elders, with other people started when I was like 12. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's just, it's such a severe stress that's put on a child. So the most difficult um, point of my life, I'd say, was when my brother was disfellowshipped um, because he was my absolute best friend, soulmate, confidant. Um, you know, he knew the the double life. He knew how it was at home and, you know, how hard we have to work and go to meetings. And then we'd be, you know, at midnight cleaning ashtrays together in bars where there's like pornography all over the walls after just coming from a meeting. And so um, there were just so many, uh, you know, um, ways that we could communicate that other people didn't know. Um, and you know, my brother was obviously hanging out with all these young people too, and he was older. So he got involved in drinking and some drugs and, and that led to him being disfellowshipped. Um, but ultimately the elders had said to him, you know, um, they were questioning him about his friends and saying, you know, tell us about other people. And he basically just said that's between their relationship with them and Jehovah. And because he said that, it was a de- it was taken as a defiant attitude, unrepentant attitude, and he was disfellowshipped because they said that his loyalty lied with Satan and not with Jehovah. Um, and right after that, I mean, he was seventeen or eighteen years old, um, and my parents just said, you know, if you're not going to attend meetings, then you got to get out of the house. And at that point, I think not only was he just wanting to be free of the pretend at home and how difficult that was, but also just uh, being free from that organization when he was surrounded by so many adults and kids that were all hypocrites. It's like nobody was really living by scriptural guidelines. It was all about living within the boundaries of the policies and procedures of a Watchtower Bible and Track Society. Um, and so it was very difficult when, uh, you know, my, my brother moved out because he didn't, he didn't go to good circumstances, you could say, because he kind of uh, went in, you know, manifesting basically what he had, what his belief system had been built to, to be based on what Jehovah's Witnesses teach, which is like doom and gloom. Um, but I mean, when, when someone is disfellowshipped, it's so disheartening because um, they give these these local needs talks and constant, you know, watch our articles. And of course, because we had so many in our area, there was very many local needs parts about how to deal with disfellowship people, which is to see them as dead. So it's no texting, no calling, no light letter writing, no nothing. And, um, you know, after my brother left, I remember this one night um, in particular, and it was just this crazy snowstorm because where I lived, there was a lot of that. Um, and we drove past my brother on the highway hitchhiking in the worst stormy weather. And my father just drove past as if 
it was just someone we didn't even know. And so, you know, just being taught to like dehumanize at such a young age um, and just there's no connection to compassion and humanity. Um, it's all about the rules and regulations of just that organization and how they want to keep such a, a perfect perception to keep their numbers up. And so, you know, it was, it was very conflicting. There were, there were quite a few disfellowshipped at that time. Um, there was also another time where my brother visited my high school and I ran up behind him to give him a hug. And I just, you know, I was just squeezing him and loving him. And, um, you know, sure enough, a couple days later, a couple young girls had told on me and I was approached by the elders saying, you know, this is unnecessary contact. And you know that if, you know, you're jeopardizing your relationship with Jehovah, you could lead the same path. You end up disfellowship. Then where are you going to go? Then, you know, you're left for Satan again. <laughs> so again, it's just like mentally traumatizing. And uh, from there, you know, um, I did what my habits told me to do, which was keep going, you know, keep getting better. You know, I, I pioneered. I was so committed that um, after grade eight, um, I decided not to go to high school. I decided to pioneer and homeschool myself. And I even, uh, you know, got like an award of excellence that I had taken away from me because so many teachers didn't agree with my decision of committing to the full time Bible service. And then from there, uh, I decided to go back to high school for grade 10. I just wanted to be with my friends. I wanted to be with people. And, and that just wasn't feeling right. Um, and I knew that I wasn't bringing in Bible studies because it, it just, you know, it wasn't it wasn't the truth. And I could identify that because scripturally things in the reasoning book just didn't add up or make sense. So I go back to high school and they actually um, they bumped me up a couple grades in certain subjects, which was amazing. And I applied for college, which, again, small town, uh, you know, it's really frowned upon. The organization does not want people educating themselves. They don't want them exposed to anyone of the outside world and that worldly association. I always thought it was because, you know, everyone would end up, you know, a prostitute and a drug addict and, and you know, a beater and all these things. But it was really just because they know that people will, you know, their eyes can be open. And once that awareness is brought to your attention, you can't go back from there. And so um, I also, I applied for journalism and thank goodness for guidance counselors really pushed me. I actually was accepted into a university in California and um, it was pretty devastating because I didn't even give it a consideration because um, I just thought, you know, if I go off from my family, I'll end up disfellowshipped like everybody else I grew up with. So I thought, let me stay close enough, an hour away, went to school for journalism. Um, a lot of people had a lot to say about that because, um, you know, just the involvement in politics, which, which I liked, um, and also like the action, you know, the possibility of TV broadcast, that type of thing would not be appropriate for a witness, let alone a Jehovah Witness woman. Um, and so I did um, go to college. Um, I only did the first year. Um, it was a fast track program. I was very grateful to get in. I was the youngest one in the program. Mm. Um, and it was very, you know, it was the best program in all of Canada. I was even approached by um, uh, CBC broadcast teachers asking me to go into TV broadcast, um, at which point, obviously, my self-esteem was so low. I didn't think I, I would even be attractive enough for TV. I felt so poorly about myself. Um, and also, I just knew that um, it would be a bad, you know, that, that word bad thing for a Jehovah's Witness to do. Um, also, because I got called into going to different political meetings within the town, and then I would write things about them in the paper or for assignments. And I started to just get just like nonstop with my aunt and uncle because I lived with them in their basement while I went to college. And they were Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm -hmm. I would get a lot of slack from them, from my family saying, you know, you're getting too involved. I had written an article on racism, which I was very, always very passionate about. I did public speaking on racism since I was like in grade three. Um, and they just said, you know, this is not appropriate. Jehovah's Witnesses need to stay neutral. And so that was, you know, long story short, that was pretty, pretty much squashed. And because 
Um, I, I wasn't feeling good. I felt very trapped, like I couldn't progress with it um, because, you know, it would affect my loyalty to Jehovah. Mm-hmm. Um, I met uh, a, a guy that was five years older than me in my aunt and uncle's congregation that I had known since I was younger, and we started dating. Um, and, you know, within eight months, um, engaged and married. Wow. So that wasn't a very long engagement at all. Uh, so how old were you when you got married? So I was 19 engaged, married at 20. Um, and as you know, once you make that commitment, it's like I was married at 19. Um, and that is the norm. I mean, uh, most Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, we under- we would understand that there's no dating to just date, to see who you like or what you might like or what situation you might like. It always has to have the intention of marriage. So you get young people who, you know, are, you know, 17, 18 years old and they're dating for a few weeks and they're asking the other person, so this, what does this mean? Like, what are we doing with this? Um, and it was the supposed to. And as you know, a lot of young people get married because they just want to have sex before marriage. They just want some kind of that sexual experience um, and that's not prohibited. Uh, a lot of people get in trouble before they get married. They get disfellowship. They get publicly reproved. Their privileges taken away. You name it. Um, and we, we know this goes on, you know, pretty much with everyone. And even with my husband and I, we actually went to the elders before we got married. You know, and and it, it's crazy to think that I was about to get married and I'm sitting in a room with three men asking me how I was touched, where I was touched, when, and all these ridiculous details. When, mm. you know, it's like I'm full grown, living on my own, and I'm about to make a decision on marriage, and I need your approval uh, for sexuality. Um, and so we actually weren't sure if we were going to be allowed to be married in the kingdom hall because that would be considered a gross sin. Um, we actually had some pretty understanding elders and we did get married in the kingdom hall, but you know, there was people who, who didn't agree. Um, and so again, it is normal for, for young people to just jump into those circumstances, especially for a woman, because once you've done anything with a, a, a boy or a guy, man, whatever, uh, mentally women feel that, well, I better get married because even for myself, I thought, well, no one else would want me. And that is what is programmed. And that's why there's so many of these youth marriages, um, you know, and then they're, they're, they stay in these relationships based on like fear tactics. Um, and I got married because I got married young. My sister followed in my footsteps. So she was 18. She hadn't, didn't even have her high school diploma. And, uh, she got married to a regular pioneer ministerial servant. Um, and you know, everything seemed to, to be okay at the beginning. We had suspect thoughts. Um, but sure enough, it was just shortly after he started abusing her really, really brutally. Um, and also this was another norm, especially because for these young people getting married so young, they're not exposed to each other. Um, they're not even supposed to be alone in a setting. For even five minutes, you have to be chaperoned. So how do you really know who you're marrying and what you're going to be exposed to once that ring is on your finger? Mm. And once the ring's on your finger, there's so much um, fear-based material that just forces you, again, to trust in Jehovah and pray more. Um, And so this was a big trigger for me with my sister uh, getting married and uh, into this abusive relationship. What's the most disturbing now when I look back is that there were times where it was like I wasn't coming to save her because part of me would, the subconscious would trigger, well, what did she do? You know, how was it her fault? You know, she did she, did she really tick him off enough? Like just ridiculous thoughts as if um, this would be the woman's fault, um, especially because they write this in watchtowers. They actually write um these different things. And it got to the point where, you know, he, he threw over tables and, and busted her head open. She ended up with nine stitches and found herself sitting in an elders meeting and them telling her, well, you're not praying together. You need to pray more and you need to pray for him and you need to have, you know, this and that. And, you know, we tried to encourage her to press charges and she didn't because, 
again, it's all about being programmed not to bring reproach on Jehovah's name, which is, you know, their ultimate goal of through for their society. And so, you know, years later, um, I guess we were married about um, 16 years later. Uh, so many things because I'd been exposed to so many different friends and relatives who were exposed to abuse and reading these articles. I got to the point where um, when those articles, we'd be studying them during the meetings, um, I'd have to get up. I would take my kids into the mother's room. I'd be walking around the back. I just couldn't physically sit and listen to it anymore because it would make me just nauseous and hot. Um, and I had, uh, you know, went through an experience with, um, uh, my second childbirth, uh, was footling breach. And so I had to have an emergency C-section and I experienced, um, a spinal leak in my back and, um, there was fluid hemorrhaging around my brain and I thought I was going to die. It was crazy pain. And it, you know, ended up being, you know, sometimes I wouldn't be able to walk for two weeks at a time. And, um, and because of that, I started to do research on people like Louise Hay and Joe Dispenza and started to learn about the power of the mind and how you can heal your body through thought. Um, this was very conflicting to me at first because uh, in Jehovah's Witnesses, obviously the teachings are you don't go for outside teachings. You just pray and you just stay faithful and you live in suffering. Um, but I was such an active, physically active, athletic mom that I had to do something. So I started with um, uh, researching that type of thing. And then it was crazy how sequential events just um, fell into um, fear-based mind control within religions. And um, because I was so conflicted, so I was so committed to, to uh, you know, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society and what I thought was Jehovah, um, I decided to get up every day for 30 days and really early, it was like 4.45 a.m., and read the Bible, just the Bible by itself, and pray. Pray for like half an hour and talk about all these things and please let, you know, the truth be revealed to me. Because I, I was really emotionally invested and almost felt ashamed in doing this like other research. Um, but, but again, when I started to study the fear-based mind control of religion and how it stemmed from like MK Ultra mind programming back in the war times, mm. um, early 1900s, I realized that there was a very, very systemized setup here that they were manipulating people through um, – mental programming. So I stopped attending the meetings. Um, and my research just got deeper and deeper. Um, by at that point, I hadn't been attending for like about seven months. Um, and I hadn't even seen one quote unquote apostate video. I hadn't even been exposed to that. I was literally doing my own research. Um, and I came to realize soon after within like two days, uh, I came across John Cedar's videos and some other things. And all of these pieces, you know, just came together in my clarity and in realizing that I needed to take the step for for my family um, and, and make some huge changes, but not without a cost, of course, you know. So um, just one day, I made a very quick decision. I shouldn't say quick, all right? I've been sitting on it for a while, but um, I just acted on it. So um, August 1st, I wrote a letter to disassociate myself. I wrote a very friendly letter, wrapped it up in one sentence, just saying, because of your intentionally dishonest manipulation, um, you know, in teaching, yada, yada, I choose to disassociate myself, not from my friends or my family, but from the Watchtower Bible and track society statistics. So if I could recommend for anyone who's contemplating leaving or, or on the fence or wanting to do more research, just give your per yourself permission to do that. Because um, like any good business that is out there online, you know, all the details of a business is posted. And you know, you will you put it to the test. Mm -hmm. So you know, even if you're a biblical person, Jesus said, keep on seeking and put everything to the test. So just give yourself permission to, you know, not listen to maybe what everybody else is saying, but do your own research and, and, you know, everything's out there online. And I'm very grateful for that. Absolutely. And I really want to thank you for uh, taking the time out uh, to speak with me. It's such an incredible story. But as we, as we said, 
you know, it has a lot of uh, familiar aspects to it. You know, some things that we see very common in, in a lot of people's stories uh, as far as growing up in this organization. Uh, I'm sure you're going to inspire many people by this uh, by this interview. And once again, I just want to thank you for taking time out to speak with me. Yeah, it was great to be here. I hope I can help anybody.